Hey guys, this is Peter and you're listening to All Jiu Jitsu Podcast. We've got episode number 15 for you today. Our guest is Jimmy Pedro, a two-time Olympic medalist in judo, judo world champion and former coach of the USA Judo Olympic team. However, as you may expect from this podcast, we're not going to focus on his past accomplishments. Jimmy is a very successful businessman, being the president of Fuji Mats and the VP of Fuji Sports. Fuji Mats especially had a, such a stellar growth in the last number of years. They have outfitted some of the most iconic academies, including Hanso Gracie Academy in New York, Hodger Gracie Academy in London, and even the combat space in Joe Rogan's studio. This conversation is very informative, educational from a business perspective, and very much inspirational from a personal point of view. I hope you guys enjoy this episode, and if you do, please do the following things. Subscribe on our YouTube channel, which is always a tremendous help. Follow us on Instagram at all underscore jujitsu and tell all your friends that this is the best new jujitsu podcast there is. Thank you. Enjoy. Jimmy, thanks so much for your time and for joining all jujitsu podcast. Absolutely. My pleasure, Peter. So you are the, uh, as I understand correctly, the vice president of Fuji Sports and the president of Fuji Mats. Okay. That's correct. And uh, so a lot of people obviously will know you from your um, competitive and coaching career in judo, uh, but uh, again, consciously staying away from your, from your past and focusing on your, on your present and the future. Um, so tell us a little bit about your role in, within these companies and uh, perhaps the origins of uh, Fujimat specifically, because I think a lot of jiu-jitsu people will be familiar with, the, with, with that part of the business um, because it's, it's, it's grown. Yeah. It's a bit complicated, but I'll give you a quick summary of sort of my professional life, if you will. So after competition, uh, you know, after I retired from competitive competition, I actually went to work for a big uh, internet, internet company called Monster.com. Monster.com was a job site. It helped people find jobs. And they actually sponsored the U.S. Olympic team. And they were looking to hire an Olympian who would help other Olympians find jobs. So that was my first job after my athletic career was working for at the time monster was like a 200 million dollar company it had job sites all over the world but the lessons i learned at monster because it's some really smart internet marketing guys that i worked for and specifically sports marketing guys who we had a sponsorship with the olympics we had a sponsorship with the ncaa we had a a uh, football nfl sponsorship so we're big into sports marketing which I learned a ton from those guys on the internet marketing. It was a to get every day for eight hours, drive an hour to my dojo, and then I'd go run my dojo, you know, from six o'clock till 10 p.m. And, you know, it became a real struggle because it wasn't something that I loved doing because it was, you know, internet marketing and sports marketing. And then when my bosses left the company, then it really became a struggle because you know I wasn't working with really smart guys anymore. They got rid of all of their sponsorships, and it really was just more you know paper click stuff, and it really wasn't that exciting for me. And my wife is the one who actually said, "Hey, you should break off and do everything 100% focused on martial arts, which is your passion, and then it won't be seen as a job anymore." So the first opportunity that came along was another mat company came and said, "Hey, we're looking to be a player in the U.S. market. You're a recent Olympian or Olympic." Big medalist, we need a spokesperson for our company. Will you come represent us as a as, as a brand? And I said to the owner at the time, I said, I'd love to be a spokesperson, but is there any job opportunity here? Is there a way I can leave my full time career and help you guys sell product or represent your company in a bigger, more meaningful way? So they gave me that opportunity, and I started out as just a regular sales rep and a spokesperson who went to all of their events and networked with all of the key athletes to growing that brand and becoming the vice president of the company, number two in charge of the company, running their entire sales team, their marketing, their event events, et cetera. And so I did that for about eight years where I grew that brand to be well, one of the most recognizable brands in the mat industry. And then it got a point in time where um, I really was looking to become a future owner in that company and really wasn't given the opportunity that I had hoped for and that had been promised to me. So I left and I went to Fuji Sports full time. Now Fuji Sports was a gear and gear brand focused on the soft goods and you know the, the apparel side of the business. 
And uh, they had been sponsoring me since the year 2000 as an athlete. Like I wore Mizuno geese. They're the official distributor of Mizuno in the United States. So I took my expertise that I had learned at, at monster.com, my connections from the mat world, and actually helped grow Fuji Sports into what it is today, which is a multi-international um, global brand. Um, while I was on the sideline doing the Fuji Sports stuff, a couple of the, the key employees, the, the head manager of the other mat company and the top sales guy approached me and said, hey, Jimmy, I know you have a one-year non-compete, but we don't really like working here anymore. Is there any way possible you would help us start a mat company together? And I said, guys, if you want in, I'm in. Like, I'll help you do whatever you want. And so that's how Fuji Mats got started. Two of the top guys from the other mat company joined me at Fuji Mats, and we just created our own company and our own brand here in America. Yeah, that's very fascinating. I didn't uh, a lot of interesting dynamics here. And the first thing I would like to kind of highlight, and for, for me, it's, it's really um, kind of what stands out is the the fact that you very quickly recognized and realized um, that your role in these companies can be far beyond simply, as you said, a spokesperson, right? Somebody who has certain credentials in the in the competitive world that can be just the face of the company, but you could really learn and apply the business skills and almost your your image almost becomes secondary to your actual skills in in running these companies so that that is amazing and i hope a lot of people will take inspiration from that and i said not just rely on on your past credentials uh for that so that's fantastic and um if we talk about the you mentioned mat industry so what does that in, what does that look like in the world like are there kind of a, a number of key players in the world like what uh, i know there's like a lot of manufacturers in asia like o oem manufacturers right uh yes. some people go direct to those but what does it look like overall so in, in there's specific types of mats right there's there's traditional judo tatami style product in that particular in that particular mat style there's really only about three or four major manufacturers of those goods uh there's a couple in in europe there's one in Asia. there's actually three in europe there's one in asia that are really quality manufacturers of that product line and those those uh manufacturers then resell to brands like ours so we fuji mats our mats are manufactured in europe and we actually are the main distributor for all of that that whole line of product here in the United States. But at the same time, it's not just like we're selling somebody else's product. We've actually helped them develop the the density of the product. We've we've really taken a hard look at the the vinyl, you know, the type of vinyl that's used, the quality of the vinyl, how the mats. Like we've had a lot of input into the manufacturing process, and we haven't done a Fuji mats way. Like we want it done this way, and we get exclusives on certain product lines and in certain ways that the product is manufactured with that manufacturer where they're not allowed to make it for other people. So it's, it's really a Fuji Mats help develop this product for the United States market and now for the global market. Um, and then yes, above and beyond that, I did go to school at Brown University. I studied business. So not only am I an athlete, I'm an educated athlete who has taken his, his acumen from his education and bringing it to the business world and applying it. So not just a spokesperson, not just an athlete, but really diving into these companies and figuring out like what's important, how, like what are the margins, how are we going to sell this product, how where are we going to warehouse it, strategically, how can we set this company up the best for success? And like the Fuji Mats, um, the Fuji Mats model is brilliant, and I say that because we have very little overhead. All of our overhead is our staff and our people. Like we don't own our own warehouse. We don't have any uh, money tied up in inventory. We all work remotely. So even before, you know, COVID-19 and things like that, that require you to shut down your company, all of our people are used to working remotely because we've done that for five years. You know, my partners are in Minnesota. We have, you know, customer service reps in other parts of the country. So Skype meetings, Google Hangouts, you know, Zoom, all this stuff is just normal for us. So we're able to function in this difficult time as if my, my day hasn't changed. I still walk upstairs in my house, go to my home office and do my job all day long. And then instead of going to the dojo and teaching students right now, because they're shut down, I'm actually just working out in my basement gym. 
you know, with my kid and weight training and doing grappling and all that stuff. So, you know, it's, uh, we, when I say it's a genius setup, when you think about not having warehouse expenses right now, not having all your money tied up in, in inventory, like none of that, we have none of those expenses. Our only expenses are our employees and our marketing. So if we only make $5, it's still $5 we have then to go spend on, on something. Uh, and that's amazing. It's a very kind of lean setup, right? Um, so it's again a very good um, lesson, I guess. Uh, you know, when when you can show what what that lean setup can do in the, in a time of crisis, because it's mm-hmm. so easy, especially when you find a little bit of success, right? So you, the, the the cash the cash flow was positive. You know, money starts rolling in as you become more successful. It's so easy to get carried away and decide oh, I need this massive warehouse or I need this and that and build it up to the, to the point where you've created this beast that in the time of crisis you can't feed because, you know, it just wants too much food, All right? Yes. So uh, that, that is a really, um, again, I'm a huge advocate for that as well, for the, for the lean setup as you explained it. So what, is your, what does your company look like now in, uh, in terms of the number of people that are working for you? Uh, you said they all work remotely and uh, the kind of overall operations and how you do you manage to, to have the setup where you have no inventory? Because for a lot of people, what, what they would have an idea, and I, I would have the same kind of idea uh, before talking to you that, you know, you have to stock you know, a pile of mats, essentially, and then kind of redistribute them to, to the various locations. So how do you, how have you managed to build, build up the structure um, that you have currently? Really through partnerships. You know, one of the keys to success in, in, in my, the businesses that I've been involved in, it's all about partnerships and it's all about relationships. So one of the reasons why we had some such, such explosive growth in both companies is because um, of, of the people that we aligned ourselves with. And I always believe in helping people. That's always my judo career was a result of everybody investing in me, helping me. You know, I went to to the United Kingdom many, many times, Japan, Germany. I was all over the world. And if it wasn't for people bringing me into their homes, allowing me to stay with them, train with them at their dojos, feed me, you know, dinners with their parents and, and you know, their families. Without that support, I wouldn't have been a successful judoka. And the same, that's the way I approach my business as well. I feel it's an obligation. If people have dreams, let's help invest in those dreams. Let's help their, you know, when they're starting out, when they're small, let's help them do what it is they want to do. And the ones that, if it's a good business decision, the ones that actually succeed will, will then give back and support you in return. And they'll remember what you did for them. You know, one great example of that is, is one of my students. Um, he's an internet marketing sort of guru. He started judo and BJJ fanatics. So he does all the videos for all the stars. He has probably the biggest, most successful business right now in this, in this time. Um, It was BJJ fanatics. So I was his first DVD project ever. He got his start with me and we launched it really slow and small. And all of a sudden now he's got this giant business and anything he's tried to do over time, like when he first needed mats and wall pads for these stars to come into his home basement and shoot videos, I made sure it was loaded up with Fuji mats. I gave him his product. I said, just give me the marketing rights, you know, to everything you do. And now if you see everybody's videos, it's basically shot on Fuji mats with Fuji mats and exposure in the background. And it's a partnership with judo fanatics and BJJ fanatics. So that market, that's free marketing for me. It was a small investment up front, but now this company is super successful. And everything he tries to do, we do together. So if he wants to host an event, he runs the event a lot of times out of my dojo. He doesn't have to rent the facility. He puts on a nice show. He videotapes it all. So like all of those partnerships, I think are really important. Same thing with a guy who wants to start a franchise business. Maybe Uh, it's a, it's a one successful gym and he wants to branch off and open multiple affiliates or multiple gyms. Well, if we partner with him and help him make that a reality, then they're loyal to you in the long run. And that's what I've always believed in is helping people, you know, accomplish what it is they want to accomplish and and not always making it just about money. 
Yes, it's a, it's a long-term uh, relationship development, right? So right. You, it's a tight-knit community and, you know, certain things will pay off and it, it doesn't have to be... A lot of the times, I think, when 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 people speak about this and a lot of, you know, it, it's, a, it's a trendy, let's say, way of thinking about it. It's like you have to invest in your relationships, you have to cultivate those. But it's not like a cynical way of saying, oh, one day it's going to pay off. No, you just do it. First of all, most of the time it doesn't even cost you anything aside from, you know, some time and actual empathy and right. um, and connecting with people and then as i said this you know common effort comes to fruition uh, in and, and grows into something useful and as you said bjj fanatics and now judo fanatics and i, I also believe they have fanatic wrestling so three yeah. three core things uh, with uh, bernardo yes. and michael zenga right so yes. i mean it's uh, it's the kind of the ultimate story of success in, in and it's all intertwined you know travis stevens is is our marketing guy at fuji sports he was my olympic star athlete he's he's on the judo he flies around the world for judo fanatics using his connections to to help bring stars to the to that so it's it's all an interwoven family you know with it with its own arms and legs yes and i've, I've noticed it kind of from the very beginning what you what you were talking about in terms of the the presence this the smart presence of um fuji mats you know you have your kind of signature stamp on the, on the mats which is which is genius uh in a way like it's, it, it is free marketing so um which takes back which takes me back to remember i told you from the beginning i, I started learning at monster.com with some guys that were really smart sports marketing guys. This is all just carryover from the marketing and branding, sponsorships, partnerships that, that we did back in those days, and I'm just bringing it to the martial arts arena. And when you talk about sports marketing, um, how distinct the methods or the, the ways of doing things in sports marketing are different to kind of general marketing? Is there some, or do, do you understand what I mean? Um, so I like, I like doing integrated sponsorships, integrated partnerships. It's not just about me paying you to have my logo in the background. That's great. That's well and good. But if it doesn't pay back to me or it doesn't help me in any way, you know, I, I think that a lot of times just having your logo somewhere doesn't really do enough. It really has to be a partnership where I'm helping you and opening doors for you you know, and, and new markets for you or new customers for you. And in exchange, you're doing the same for me. Like, and I believe in like a multifaceted um, sponsorship where, you know, it's experiential. I want my mats on the floor or I want my brand there present for your guys to compete on, to train on so that they get to experience my product and also have my, my, my logo present. So like ADCC is another perfect example. Like, I've always invested in, in sponsored the ADCC championships because I want the best grapplers on the planet to be, be competing on my product that I've developed and designed with a special feel to the texture of the floor. So that they go back and say, wow, that mat was not slippery. That felt amazing. I didn't get mat burns. Like I love that product and it's Fuji mat. It's like it's memorable experience for them, you know, and then above and beyond that, we want to make sure that, you know, we get the list of all of the people that attended the event and we send them some sort of, you know, email or, or hard copy for this event. Um, some will try to sell the mats after the event. So we get, we, we mark as an added all of the people who attended. So the ADCC wins because they get the mats at, you know, sponsored by us and put on the floor. We win because we get all of the exposure and people get to experience our brand. Um, we actually sold the mats after the event to all the people in the local schools that got to buy them afterwards. Like it's a totally, um, we get to have a presence at the event. You know, it's, it's more than just our, our logo is seen here type of stuff. Yeah. So it's the action and activity associated with the, with the sponsorship, as you said, the integrated approach rather than simply slapping the logo here and there. Uh, right, here's five grand. Content. Go put my logo, go put my logo on your, on your website or something or on the podium. Like, that doesn't really help us that much. And, it, and it's also, especially in the business of something like mass, right? It's not, it's not like your standard consumer goods, with, which, which you can measure, you know, per, per click. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, this this people rarely, without having some sort of significant consideration or even a conversation and cons consultation with you, go on to buy the mats, right? They just, uh, I imagine that rarely people just literally go on the website and say, give me a hundred of these and ship me over. Like there has to be, it's a significant investment for, for most of the schools, right? It's a significant investment. And I'd like to, our company really 
um, does a great job of being consultative in our approach. Like, it, don't just tell me you need 60 mats. Tell me about your business. What type of school do you run? What type of training do you do on the mats? How many classes do you run at the same time? Let, let, let us design the experience you want to give your customers. We're the experts. We've built the biggest and best gyms over the last 20 years. Like my guys have helped build all of those, those facilities. So whether it's Penzo Gracie's Academy or Hodge Gracie's Academy or, you know, uh, the original American top team and, you know, Brazilian top team gyms, like all of the major gyms in this country, our guys have helped design and build straight blast gym and international, et cetera. So like, we want, we want your dream to become a reality, and we're going to talk to you about what's important to you. You want the right, what's the right product to put on the floor? What other products do you need? What's the flow going to look like? What's the feel going to look like? Do you need a subfloor? You know, are you doing Muay Thai training only in this area, in jiu-jitsu in that area? Like, tell me more about it. Don't just tell me you need five mats or whatever it is. You know what I mean? And then let us come up with a solution that fits your business needs. Like we, our guys really take the time to listen and really care about the end result. And you'll see in our marketing efforts on our website, we always share the facilities that we're affiliated with and we're proud of the work that we do. You know, it, it, it's, and it's also about, I don't want to just sell you something. And I'll tell you, if your budget's only this much, then I'm probably not the right company for you at this time. But when you grow into a bigger place and you, you know, you've got a big student base, then come see us. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, and uh, also in on your logo and the the the, um, the stamp, as I said, that goes onto the mats. It's it specifically says it's cover it's sports surfaces, oops, uh, um, and facility design. So, what right. does facility design entail? And what does and how complex can it actually get? If you can give me also examples of different surfaces so all the questions that you you said you would consider how could it differ from for one school that that perhaps runs only jiu-jitsu classes mm -hmm. versus somebody else who does mma training and muay thai training and judo for example which i, I presume needs a slightly different surface if it's only like a grappling yeah so we have everything we have everything from a five eighths inch yoga style mat so five eighths inch is really really thin so about a half, an, it's about, uh, I don't know, millimeters, so <laughs> centimeters. So 2.54 centimeters in one inch. So you're talking about a product that's about 1.25 centimeters thick, really, really thin, but very, very dense and hard. Why? Because yoga people like a stable floor to stand on. They don't want it to be squishy because they need to have stability. But a lot of times in, in environments like hot yoga, the floor gets too slippery because you're sweating profusely on a hardwood floor. So it's a danger to the, the customer. So we've developed a, a, a half inch, super dense wall to wall yoga flooring system for yoga, for hot yoga specifically. And it has a moisture proof backing on the underside, a non-slip uh, surface on the top, so that no matter how wet it gets, it's still safe and it's comfortable. And it also insulates the room so that if they're trying to feed it with heat, it'll maintain the heat of the room. It doesn't get lost through the flooring. So that's one example. We also have, you know, all the different thicknesses are meant for different arts. So a one inch thick product, which is only um, 25 millimeter, that product is designed for stand up training. Again, you do a lot of, you know, Taekwondo and Muay Thai and that sort of stuff. You want a very firm, hard surface. So you can, you can pivot quickly. You can move freely on the mat. You don't sink in, but you don't need a big thick product because you're not doing any falls and takedowns, right? So we have a very dense product for that standing grappling arts. Um, then when you get into the grappling arts like judo, jujitsu, usually we get into a 40 millimeter product, which is a little bit thicker, but it's also less dense. So we've created a foam with less density to it. So it has a softer feel when you're kneeling down all the time on the product, it's not uncomfortable. You know, and then when you hit the floor, it's a little softer feel to it um, and it absorbs the impact of the fall. So the foam that we use inside of the mat is actually a breathable foam. It's, it's, it, expand, it doesn't expand and contract with, with temperature changes. It actually absorbs all the, all the air gets like pushed out of the product when you land on it. But as soon as you leave, it comes back. It's like memory foam. It comes back to its full height and density. So, and that product lasts. 10 years, the foam won't break down after 10 years, it'll be fine. It's just the, the vinyl surface eventually gets worn out, but the foam itself doesn't. 
And then when you get to the highest end of the spectrum, you get into like, you know, pro MMA training or really hardcore judo training. Then we usually recommend a two inch thick or a 50 millimeter product. You know what I mean? And that has, you know, more foam, more absorption, more protection to it. Um, so that's sort of the evolution of the thickness of the mat. Then we also look at surfaces. So I might say, do you do a lot of no gi training or a lot of wrestling with shorts? You know, if so, we might want to look at a product that has a, a smooth texture on the top, right? Because the smoothness of it now eliminates mat burns where people aren't going to get skin burns on their knees or on their elbows. And believe it or not, when you shoot a wrestling shot without shoes on, you know, the top of your foot skins across the mat when you shoot a single or a double. If you're on a traditional tatami textured rough surface, it rips the skin off your feet or off your knees. So we want to understand, do you do mostly no gi or do you do mostly gi training? You know, what type of training? Is it MMA or is it traditional martial arts? And basically based on what behavior you're going to do and what discipline is most important to your gym, we're going to recommend that right product for your needs. And then in some cases, people want, you know, I have an older audience or I do a lot of like really hard throws and takedowns. I need a little more protection. We've developed a whole subfloor system for them where it, you know, it might just be a simple layer of foam that they put underneath our product to give it a little bit extra protection. When you go with multi-density type of products together, it actually has more give than just the mat itself. All the way up to, you know, foam blocks and plywood floor systems. And then eventually we have a premium sprung floor product, which is actually made with springs, birch plywood that's already pre-made, pre-assembled, that ships to you ready to assemble. So like we've come up with a solution for every floor and every grappling need. It's not just, oh, roll this mat out and you're good. No, we, wanna, we want the best mat with the best protection, which happens to be the best solution for your needs. So in terms of facility designing, um, it's not just the mats. We also take a look at the entire facility. So if you send me the blueprint or your, your, your CAD design from your architect, my guys will take that and have a conversation with you about, you know, do you want to have a seating area? Where's the locker room is going to be? Where are the bathrooms going to be? Let's maximize the floor space. I notice you've got two poles in here. Let's end the mats before the poles. We'll protect those poles with padding. We'll wall pad these sides. We'll build you bag rack systems, heavy bags, trolley racks that move the bags out of the way so you can maximize your space. Like we get into everything and my guys on my team have designed all of these products ourselves. We've gone to the manufacturers. We've contracted them to make them according to our specifications. We want this gauge steel. We want, you know, this, we want to be able to powder coat it with the color we want. We want these trolleys to hang like, We've designed everything from, from floor to ceiling to help come up with the best designs and the def, best products for our customers' needs. Yeah, so it's, it's quite a quite extensive process. So if we talk about then um, the order process from the from the customer's perspective, if I am contacting you as like making that initial initial step of reaching out and saying, hey guys, Fuji, I need... Um, help with the facility design with everything so what does that process take then from the initial contact to the end and delivery and um, especially given the fact that you now operate worldwide you have you know a number of people in your team um, so how do you manage your capacity uh, for to deliver these projects and what does it take to as i said to get to receive the order i presume you have to then order those uh, those products at the with various contractors and manufacturers to then deliver them to the um, to the locations so it, it, it depends on the product line that you that you particularly order so we have in the United States we do have a big stock of all of our all of our mats so we have a huge stock of mats in the United States um, but we've partnered with the manufacturers so that they they help us with the warehousing costs they help us with the inventory etc so we can ship if it's just mats, we can ship those and deliver those to anywhere in the United States in like two weeks from the time you order till it delivers to your doors two weeks time. But sometimes this projects can take a full year because it all depends on the customer and where they are in their whole cycle. Sometimes they haven't even signed a lease with their building owner yet. And they're sending us the specs because they want to know how much it's going to be to build this place out. So sometimes we're working that early on with people and sometimes we'll design a whole gym and then the lease will fall through and then we have to go design another gym later. 
So that process sometimes can take up to a year, but that's really dependent on the customer. If somebody has a lease that's already signed and they want product as soon as possible, then typically, again, we can get them mats in as little as two weeks. If they happen to be in Europe, then it might take four, four weeks or five weeks because it has to be manufactured. They're on demand. They're not, um, they're not stocked in Europe. They're actually made, made to order. So the lead time is about four weeks in Europe. Um, but if we get into bag rack systems and things like that, steel typically takes us four to six weeks to manufacture because a lot of customization goes into that steel. I mean, we actually, we etched the Fuji logo in some of the brackets that, that hold the, that hold the uh, heavy bags. Sometimes customers want powder blue. Or, you know, it's hard to stock it because steel is made custom for that gym. You know, certainly they come in eight foot sections, but, or two meter sections, but if your gym is 13.5 meters, I've got to make it custom for you anyway. So it doesn't make sense to stock it. So we usually go four to six weeks on steel plus delivery times. So even if you wanted the most complicated setup at all at your facility, the maximum amount of time it would take us is about two to three months from start to deliver, depending on where you are. Yeah, and where can you name your most complex project to date? On if you have any anything specific in mind. Well, we've done a lot. We've done a re- we, we have done a lot of very very complex facilities. I mean, even Hodger Gracie's gym, even though it's just mats and wall pads, I mean, he has. If you look at his place in the UK, there's lots of like um, he has three separate rooms in there. The walls, there's three different rooms that separate uh, three different sets of walls that separate his rooms. Everything was done on the metric system. You know, so for us, it's a conversion. There's a conversion side to the whole thing. Um, he wanted logos on specific areas. So although it was just mats and wall pads, it was pretty tricky and complicated because there were so many little, uh, little columns in there that we had to deal with. And it was all done remote. So it was busy. He sent us the blueprint. We did it remotely. We designed it. We sent it back. You know, we changed the specs a number of times. We had to actually ask him to measure it a few times or his, his guys to measure it and confirm dimensions are correct and then we sent it out so that was kind of a cool one to do and it was somewhat complicated even though it was a simple product line um but you know we we did a lot of like the extreme couture facility i did years and years ago that one had um a cantilever bag rack system which is basically a bag rack system that that doesn't touch the floor and it doesn't have poles that go from the wall down to the floor so it was basically something hung off of the wall and it was hung by like a, we had to make like a trapezoidal type of rack system that had it only attached to the wall. And then we had a beam that ran the whole length of it that you could use a trolley on and pull all the, all, all the bags into a corner so that they could open up the space when MMA training was going on. Um, and, you know, we did everything from, from cage panel walls, uh, cage panel walls in there to, to MMA mats, to a cage, to a ring. You know, it was really a complex project. The other one that was tricky was uh, uh, I did Henzo Gracie's gym in, in New York City headquarters. And, man, it's, if you've ever been to the Henzo, Henzo headquarters, it's in the basement of a, a Manhattan building, and nothing is straight. The floors aren't even. The walls aren't straight. One wall is made out of concrete. One made is, is made out of sheetrock, and then a brick. It was out, uh, when I up his tar that he had we'll just start floor and we'll we'll start from scratch and when i started to pull up the floor there was this huge sewer pipe on the bottom underneath his mat that he didn't even know was there and there was just there was a piece of um plywood that was stuck over this hole i lifted up the plywood i looked down there's a three-foot hole there i said henzo i don't think we can mat we, we can't take up your existing mats we're going to have to go right over so we left his tarp and vinyl system down there and we put our mats over the top of that, which actually made it a really super comfortable floor with the ultimate protection. So in the end, it turned out to be an amazing project, but sometimes when you're doing these projects, you don't know what you're getting into until you actually show up on site. But yes, there's been some very fun projects. Sure, and you can, you can, I know in my own experience as well, because we, 
and we've uh, acquired our gym from somebody else and we literally didn't know what was underneath the mats and everything and we eventually had to lift them <laughs> there's, there's all sorts of things you find like the, literally as you explained <laughs> different holes in there there's like some pipes running under the floors etc so uh, it's uh, it's pretty fascinating um, yeah that's the um, and what would you say is overall running your business whether it's installation or whatever else is what do what do you think are the most challenging parts of your business and where do you and where were the key learnings over the years that you worked for um for 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 this type of business i think i think the most challenging part really is that um with the with the with the rise of mma and everybody being on television all the time you know, if you think about it, you had Strike Force, you had Bellator, you had UFC, now you have PFL or WSOF. You've got uh, the the one championships in China. You've all these massive MMA promotions where all of these people are on TV all the time. They're all seen as stars, right? Because they're they're spokespeople, they're 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 television almost personalities, and they're all looking for sponsorships all the time. And you know, as a company that 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 manufactures and and sells great product it's high quality product it's not cheap you know it, it's expensive to make so it, it, it the struggle was how do we open up all these gyms and help all of these people but then show them some value for who they are and what they and what they bring to the table to validate our brand um they all wanted discounts they all want sponsorships etc and it's how do you create a partnership with them but still figure out a way to, to make money because at the end of the day, who opens gyms? Professional fighters. So our core, our core market or the core customer is somebody who always wants a big discount where you make no money. So it, it's, it's kind of a tricky balance because they're the ones that also can afford to buy the stuff that you're looking to sell as well. At the end of the day, there's only so many customers that can open up these massive gyms that you can sell to. So there's a, there is a tricky balance there to, to, to be able to keep a company and make it a profitable company that can survive for the long haul, but yet still help the, influ the influencers who are the ones that, that really ultimately open gyms and, and who, who need your product. Yeah, and um, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I had this conversation numerous times, not with the obviously the mat manufacturers, but any sort of equipment that feeds into um into this um environment of martial arts right and again people who succeed um to a certain extent it, it's almost expected they will get some some form of recognition in the form of sponsorships from the companies that produce for the market but if we talk about jiu-jitsu even specifically where it's relatively easy to succeed in terms of the various tournaments and the splits yeah. in the divisions and everything so everybody's winning something right right, right? Yes, but everybody's also the customers of those companies. They want them to 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 be sponsored by. So how do you? That's like this dichotomy, of of how do you balance that exactly? As you explained, you know, I'm pretty sure you know the brands would love to give, to give back to the community to invest in these athletes, but they also need to make money at the same time. So if they are giving you something for free, not only it's the cost of whatever they're giving you, you also not buying it from them. So you there's one customer less. So, right. you know, that uh, is tricky mathematics there. The, the, you know, the, the, challenge with, the challenge with that, like you said, is everybody, everybody wants something for nothing. And, and on top of that, there are, have been a lot of companies um, who have been owned by wealthy individuals who start a gi brand and start throwing out insane amounts of money to athletes. And it's not because the athlete can bring back that much exposure. It's because this wealthy individual wants to say that they're tied closely to the stars of the sport and they become a somebody because they're tied to a big name person. And what we've seen is a lot of those companies come and go, you know, they've come in, come in a flash, they throw a lot of money around. And then after a while, the guy realizes, well, this isn't really a good business venture. I'm not getting the sales back I need. And they just walk away and they're no longer in the industry. But at the same time, they've set a precedent of giving somebody $5,000 a month to represent their brand. So Fuji's done a really good job, and I, I've been an integral part of this, but we don't just give athletes money. We don't pay people to represent our brand. We basically partner with the, the biggest and best influencers and people who want to do business back with us. So 
we want to invest in school owners who have who have a lot of students who, who have multiple affiliates and we want to partner with them in a way where we help them design their own line okay we will do a henzo gracie line of product all of your affiliates all of your students can buy online from us and let us be the experts who manufacture who design who market sell warehouse fulfill let us help you grow your 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 empire together we'll benefit from it you'll benefit from it it'll be headache free you might pay more money to me than you will if you just did it on your own but i'm taking the inventory management out of the equation for you i'm taking the website expenses out of the equation you don't have to worry about warehouse costs and shipping and tracking and customer service and all of the things that we're great at that just run as a normal part through our system so we're able to help like People like Straight Blast Gym, CKO Kickboxing, um, lots of different Brazilian top team is another big customer of ours. Um, we have do Hoist Gracie, we do Henzo Gracie, we do Hodger. Like we're helping all these people um, get products to their students who want to buy from them and who want to proudly wear their brand. And we've partnered and made Fuji a sponsor and a partner with our brand and our exposure as part of their whole line. And we're actually contract manufacturing all their stuff for them. And what it's done is it's, it's created, you know, a lift for who we are, Fuji as a company, but it's also helped them focus on what they're supposed to be doing, which is running their gym successfully, growing their sphere of influence, opening additional gyms, catering to the head instructors at the different academies and the teaching and the curriculum and what's important to produce good students, you know, and eliminating the headaches from their business. I mean, when I first met some of these guys, they had all of their product locked in a cage inside of their academy. And I said, but what about the guy from, from California that calls in and says, hey, I want to order two of those. You don't even know what you have in stock. You might not have the right size. And what I hear from customers all the time is that they can't get any of the products from you. Like it never gets shipped and there's all sorts of problems. But it's not just looking at that $1. It's how do you take that? Maybe you spend three dollars more, but you sell ten times more of the product. You know, and it's easy and it's fun. So and that's what we've been able to deliver on the Fuji Sports side. Yes. Yeah, so it's as you mentioned in the beginning um, of our conversation that in, in integrated marketing approach, right? It's not. It's not just throwing around the logos and and saying you're doing what. It's it's the activity and the the um, collective effort. That, that grows the overall market, right? Rather than the individual parts. And there's there's a lot more value that can be unlocked from from the, the, this type of cooperation. So as you said, taking away the pain um, from 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 people that, that are good at running the gyms, that are good at running the classes, that are good at running their academy, but maybe not as good on the commercial side of, you know, distribution of their apparel and, you know, merchandise, which, which you specialize in. Uh, so that, that will lead me to my next question then around the, uh, the integration between the Fuji, overall Fuji and Fuji Mat. So how are they comp somewhat independent entities? Uh, how do they come together and how do they kind of mutually benefit from each other? You mentioned already some of some part of it, but if you could just elaborate on that, please. So the only way they're really integrated is that I am one, I am the president of Fuji Mats and the majority owner of Fuji Mats, and I'm a partner of Fuji Sports. So I'm the owner that's part of both. Like it, they're set up as two totally separate entities. Um, when we were originally launching Fuji Mats, we really did a, 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 took a long time coming up with the brand name. Believe it or not, even though it ended up as Fuji Mats, we did everything from Pinnacle and Apex, and we had all these different. Uh, brands that tied back to some sort of mountain or association with Fuji because we wanted them to be connected, but we didn't necessarily know and think we wanted them to have, be the same name. And at the end of all of this research and, and time, we realized that we need to leverage that same exact mountain and sun icon and we need to leverage the name Fuji. And we'll just add mats to it as a separate division, a separate company. But now when it's seen in the marketplace, each company benefits from the other. And if you think about the sponsorship side of things, there's a lot of, lot of marquee athletes that are sponsored by other gi brands, right? We want to do, Fuji Mats wants to do business with those, those customers, even if they represent a different 
gi. It's okay because Fuji Mats is a different company and we happen to design gyms. So we would limit our ability. We would, we would shrink our customer base if we only did business with people that bought Fuji gis or wore Fuji gis. So it's not a smart business venture to, to, to automatically start with a, a bigger market than, I mean, a smaller market than what really exists. And on the flip side of that, there's a lot of people that might, you know, use other matte brands, but we still want to be able to sell them our gi and gear. It's a totally different business, totally different service. So that's one way we, we differentiate it. But in terms of integration, we both leverage the same icon or brand icon. Any marketing Fuji Mads does benefits Fuji Sports and vice versa. Any partnership one has helps win the other business. So, you know, you might be buying your geese from somebody else, but we just designed a beautiful $30,000 facility for you. You had a great experience. Maybe your, your, your gi manufacturer isn't doing a great job. You want to hear more about what the sports side has to do? Let me introduce you to the guy who's in charge of that division. I'll get you right to the top. And therefore, you can, you can maybe design a gi line with Fuji or rash guards or shorts or whatever you need. So it's an opportunity for each to feed and hand off a really good experience for the customer to the other division. Yeah, that's a sort of cross-selling, right, between between right. the two divisions, which is right. kind of one of the probably smartest business strategies. Why wouldn't you utilize your existing leverage and uh, to to sell from other divisions? It's also one of the reasons why Fuji Mats had such explosive growth at the beginning, because we 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 utilize the customer base that Fuji Sports had over the last fifteen years. All of those customers that did business with Fuji Sports are potential mat customers for Fuji mats. So whereas a normal startup would have to like, you know, figure out how it's going to acquire customers, how it's going to get a customer list, et cetera, we're able to utilize the Fuji sports customer list to market the Fuji mats brand too. So we got out of the gate, we had a quick, fast, explosive ramp up time. Yes. Um, and in terms of your kind of future growth and future plans for Fuji Mats, where does that, where do you see that? Um, because obviously you've covered quite a lot of the market over the last several years. And I said, that's why I really wanted to talk to you from the very beginning, from the inception of this podcast, because like I haven't seen somebody going from zero to, to, to this, to this height in, in Mats, especially it's, it's a, as I said, it is a significant investment. It's not, it doesn't happen you know, at a, at a snap of the fingers. So where do you see your further growth and your further innovation and um, uh, expansion in, in the market? So right now, right now, Europe is, is, was doing really strong, right? Before this, before COVID hit, you know, we're going to have a little bit of hiccup here, but I think 2021, everything will pick back up again. Um, but in Europe, we want to get right now, the product line in Europe is a little bit different than what we have in the United States. The matte products are exactly the same, but when we get into things like wall pads, steel, you know, bag rack systems, that type of stuff, we haven't identified that contract labor or that construction side of it yet in Europe. So the product line is a little bit different. So right now, if a European customer wants the exact same wall pads that we have in America or the exact same steel system we have in America, we actually have to ship from the United States, which is a little bit different, difficult. It, it lengthens the lead time. It's not as great of a customer experience in Europe as it is in America, but if it's strictly mats, no problem. Like they can do that every day. So what we want to do is we want to, we want to develop that, that wall pad line in Europe and grow that so that the people in Europe can have the exact same products that the Americans have um, and give the same sort of experience in Europe that we do in the United States. So that's the next area of focus. Additionally, we just picked up a big distributor uh, in Australia. So the Australian market, he is the exclusive distributor at company, which I set up 20 years ago brand. I've now convinced him to take on the Fuji mat line instead. So a, uh, Australia is a key market. It's a big grappling market, as you know, and we see some growth going into, um, into Australia. So that's going to be our focus is getting the same product line available in all the different markets. So customers have the same experience because, you know, let's face it, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of affiliates in the, in Europe as there are in the United States. And a lot of those Europeans train at headquarters in America and they want, they want to have the same gym and the same look. And right now they don't have the 
the access to the exact same product. You know, so I want to try to accomplish that for the European market and the Australian markets. Um, but because our product is expensive, it's difficult to get through South America. You know, it's hard because that's a very, it's a much poor, much, much uh, lower economies. They don't have as much disposable income. You know, and it is an expensive product that lasts a really long time. It's a great quality product, but they don't necessarily need that quality. So typically for the, the South American market, we're usually sending like either used mats or slightly defective mats or things that don't come off the line that meet our quality standards. That's the stuff that usually makes its way to South America. Now, don't get me wrong. The foam will last 10 years. Maybe the corner's a little screwed up or the vinyl isn't perfect, but essentially it'll protect their athletes every bit as much as, as a perfect mat will. It just has a blemish on it. And that's typically what we're doing, a Southern, doing for South America right now. Yes, and that aspect, and I guess a lot of the companies are looking at the similar um, kind of process of, you know, because let's, let's face it, U.S. is the most established market, the, 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 the biggest market for, for any brand. Um, so they, they find a lot of success in the U.S. and then try to expand to other geographies. Um, it's also, as you, as you mentioned, different economics of, of the sport altogether because, um, and again, something that we spoke about previously on this podcast with, with various people is how, for example, even the perception of what a value, particular value of a particular product represents. You know, in the U.S., you could sell a gi for $200 Whereas in Europe, like nobody's gonna buy this. It's very rarely you can you can you can charge the same price or you know seminars or whatnot. So um, so the the economy of of the sport of the industry is slightly different. So I guess you you have to adjust for that obviously and try to see what you can do realistically. So the example of South America is is, is a very good one, and um, uh, yeah. So then in relation to your kind of origins again so fuji started off and again your background is in judo specifically but now um as you integrate kind of operate a lot in the let's say the, this this integrated market of jiu-jitsu especially on the fuji sports side whether it's uh, jiu-jitsu kimonos and, and apparel and stuff is is there any specific or any significant differences between the two markets judo and jiu-jitsu because the product is similar um but is are there any differences that you see kind of working with the athletes or um, academies or, or production of the products. So that's probably, as I said, moving away from the mats to kind of Fuji sports, if, if you can comment on that. So it's different market by market, right? In the United States, judo, the judo market is really, really small. There's not very many judo academies and there's not many judo academies that do it as a business. So you have, you know, I think there's, I think there's about 15,000 active judoka in America, in the entire country, there's 15,000. There's really only about maybe a hundred schools that are professional schools that have, you know, more than 50 people, you know, so you're talking about a very small market. And in that market, we have the entire market, like Fuji, Mizuno, Jimmy Pedro, Kayla Harrison, Travis Stevens, Ronda Rousey, like every champion was sponsored by our brand. So we own the judo market. I don't say that in an arrogant way. It's just such a small market. It's not that difficult to own. And since we've been here from the beginning, because the company Fuji Sports has been around selling gi and gear in this country since like 1999. So you're talking about 21 years history of, you know, being the official partner of USA Judo, selling and being present at all the events. Like we have all of the customers. That doesn't mean some of them don't go, go by other brands because of course there's there's still selection, but when the, when the market's not that big and you have all the stars and you have really good business acumen, you're going to win that business, right? A majority of it. So what, but jujitsu is, I don't know, a hundred times bigger than judo in America. It's a hundred times. And almost every single jujitsu academy does it as a business. The instructor does it as his job. That's his full-time job. So if he's doing it as a job and he needs to make money doing it, let's figure out a way to help him make money, which is, merchandising his brand you know selling gear and gear to his customers so we the, the jiu-jitsu community is much more business savvy in america than the judo instructor is and obviously judo has this history brought from japan that you're not supposed to make money it's all it's, it's about being altruistic 
you're not supposed to charge your students. You're not the most supposed to make money. It's about giving back. It's about helping others. So it was brought up from the beginning in America like that. So these instructors almost feel guilty if they're monetizing and, and making a living from their students. Whereas jujitsu was introduced to the United States as, you know, this unbelievable self-defense um, art that, that is not about sport. It's about protecting yourself. It's the best and most effective way of self-defense. So there's value to that. And all these people come here to teach their students. Most jujitsu academies, their students don't even compete. You know, most of them just do it to, for self-defense, for training as a lifestyle. It's, I equate it right now in America to sort of what motorcycles, motorcycles back in the 70s and 80s, it was, it was like a big group of people. It was a culture. Get on your Harley Davidson, drive your motorcycle out for the weekend, get free, have fun, hang out with buddies. Well, that's what jiu-jitsu is. Get together in the gym, roll with each other, go out for lunch, hang out, have fun, watch some MMA fights. It's, it's like a culture, and it's their community. It's their sense of community. So that brotherhood has, a, has kept people in the sport for a very, very long time, and because it takes a long time to get your rank, these people are valuing the fact that they got to stick with it because it's something to be a blue belt. It's something to be a purple belt. It's something to be a black. Like in judo, if you're not a black belt, everything in between white and black that is meaningless. Do you know what I mean? It's really not, it, there's, no, there's no value to it. But jiu-jitsu has created value at every rank level. And they've created champions at every rank level. And everybody can be a somebody in jiu-jitsu. And it's a big sense of community and value and they appreciate each other. So, you know, we have to sell to that, to that market, right? And like you said, Blue Belt World Champion, who's, you know, 39 years old, he won the 35-year-old to the 40-year-old division in Blue Belt at Rooster Weight. You know, he's one of a thousand world champions that year. You know what I mean? But he's a somebody at his academy and he's proud of it. And he's going to stay with it. So, you know, we, we, we um, in terms of the product itself, Yes, jiu-jitsu gis are made differently than judo gis. The amount of fabric that's used, the way they're cut is different. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't cost that much more to make a jiu-jitsu gi than it does a judo gi. It just doesn't. But there's a lot of details that go into the manufacturing process, you know, custom collars, the amount of stitching, the way it's cut, the way it's reinforced, um, you know, all the patches and the embroideries and all that stuff. Jiu-jitsu really likes that. And so you have to cater to that audience if you want to appeal to the masses. Because I feel like in jiu-jitsu, whatever you're wearing is your identity. It's who you are, right? And because it's a culture, it's like if you show up to the gym today in a fluorescent green uniform, hey, man, where'd you get that? It's cool. It's exciting, right? And then your buddy says, I'm going to beat you. And the next day he shows up in hot pink. You know, and it's like they don't need geese, but it, it makes them feel good. And it gives them their identity, and that's who they are. So it, it, it's nice because you can sell 10 geese to the same guy. And they want the latest and greatest because, you know, it, it, it's their it, – not only is it their identity, but it's, it's their pastime. It's their hobby. Instead of being out on a golf course buying a new golf club, they buy a new jiu-jitsu gi because they, they want to go in something new and cool. It's exciting. It's what they choose to spend their money on. And it's better than going to a bar and spending it all on pints of beer. Right? I mean, they're fit, they're healthy, they're, they're, this is their disposable income. This is what they choose to do with their extra money. And the nice thing is, jujitsu people, most of them are, you know, between the ages of like 25 and 45, if you think about it, right? Whereas most judo players are young little kids. Mommy and daddy have to pay and buy everything because judo drops off between 25 and 45. It's a really hard, physically demanding sport. And people don't, people like, they don't spend money on themselves in judo because they're spending it on their kids. Most of the guys in jujitsu are like, it's their lifestyle, it's their culture, their family's bought into it, their family's doing it with them. They're going, I see them all going to these events together, supporting dad and supporting little Timmy or, or Caroline who's competing in the event too. It's like a family, I don't know, has a good family feel to it. Yeah, that uh, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I was talking to um, 
uh, Ricardo Liborio from uh, yeah. uh, obviously yeah. like a, a couple of weeks ago, and he was specifically emphasizing that aspect in terms of it, it was related to jiu-jitsu business, but that understanding of it is a subculture, jiu-jitsu is a sub- and it's so much more than than sport. Mm-hmm. And again, we kind of in, in understand understand this, but I think you need to have a deeper kind of especially if you're trying to make the business in this industry you need to understand those intricacies of how the, the community functions and, and what what makes people tick and um, another question i have is which is kind of my personal curiosity um and something that you mentioned in terms of um, demographics for different sports and and uh, judo and jiu-jitsu and once i was training uh, with a with a guy who was a black belt, uh, he was running an academy, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, uh, and his partner was running the judo side of the gym. Mm-hmm. And his own son was training only judo. Son was 10 years old or so, and I was asking him, why, why does he not train with you Jiu-Jitsu? You have kids Jiu-Jitsu class, why, why do you make him train judo? And he said, you can, you can learn Jiu-Jitsu anytime, but you, once you are too old past a certain threshold you can't really learn judo be good at judo anymore is that is that your view on on the subject as well it's very difficult to do it yes as at an older age it's a much harder sport to learn and i think that your muscles have i think jiu-jitsu it has a feel to it don't get me wrong and it has uh you know you have to consciously be aware of what the next step is and look ahead and you have to be smart right to do jiu-jitsu but i feel like the level of coordination in judo, it, it, I always say it's like a three-dimensional sport, right? You, you're thinking about taking somebody from a standing position, going underneath their center of gravity, picking them up and slamming it. You have to be aware of your entire body. And that muscle coordination and development, if you can learn it as a kid, it becomes instinct. You don't have to think about it anymore. When you're an adult, you think about everything. Well, why? How? You question. As a kid, you don't question. You just do. There's no obstacles to learning. Sensei shows you how to do it. You just grab and you just copy as a kid. And so it's very important to learn judo at a young age. If you want to be really good at it, it is much easier to do as a kid. And once you learn it, it's like riding a bike. You don't forget it. Do you know what I mean? Like you remember it forever. It stays with you because it's muscle memory and feel. And it, it is very important to learn at a young age. It's certainly much harder to learn at an older age. I said the best combination, like everybody talks about, how do we make judo successful in America? Or how could we grow judo in America? The only truly real way to do it, in my opinion, is to take jiu-jitsu schools and have the instructor, have that club start teaching judo to kids. Certify that jiu-jitsu instructor in judo. They don't have to learn any of the mat work stuff that judo does, but they have to learn all of the throws, all of the falls of judo and certify that jujitsu instructor and put him on a path to become a black belt in judo, the throwing aspects of judo, and then help his business attract kids, young kids, and have him teach judo to kids that walk in the door instead of jujitsu. Because in my opinion, judo is a much more dynamic, fun sport to learn and to do as a kid. It's a lot of instructors struggle teaching jujitsu to little kids because at the end of the day, it's some, it gets somewhat boring for a little kid to be on the ground all the time. It's cool to wrestle for a little while, but the discipline needed and the muscle control to, to do guard position and to, you know, to do all these intricate things, it's, it's challenging for a little kid. Whereas judo is actually really easy and fun, and you're always on your feet, and you're running, and you're tumbling, and you're rolling, and it's, it's much more dynamic. And so I feel like you could grow judo quickly by helping that school owner attract a whole new segment and have less frustration teaching that segment and retain them much, much longer. And then when they become teenagers, let them choose. You want to go to jujitsu or you want to stay with judo. And then we could exponentially grow our, our sport in America really quick. And it has benefit to everybody because that jujitsu instructor, a lot of times their adult students, they don't really want to learn the takedowns. It's really hard for their body. Right. And, after of your kids how to fall their bodies would be accustomed to it so in 10 years time your kid that was started with you when he was 10 he's now 20 he's an awesome takedown expert and he loves jujitsu because he's been doing since he's 13 as well you know what i mean and there's a way to create some 
cross pollination of each other's athletes. It's a different uh, approach to um, conditioning the body because the body is eventually becoming the vehicle that you're using, right? To to execute certain techniques, and um, yeah, I would I would I would agree with that. And I said this is the idea that I had, even though I don't have any background in judo whatsoever. I started, uh, you know, in jujitsu, but observing what goes into the sports like judo in wrestling i know that you can you can't really re learn them as a as a full functioning adult if you want and that is instinctive part as you mentioned uh that only can be acquired as a, at a younger age and um, so i would probably agree that you know kids would probably benefit more from judo and wrestling than from you know the jiu-jitsu and the the whole um kind of spectrum of techniques in, in well, jiu -jitsu. Let, let's also face it kid what what little kid do you know that's seven years old that wants to get choked no seriously it's not that fun to get choked right it's a, they're, they're not they don't understand at that age as well and giving up it's pain that's created it's tapping out it's submitting it's not the right mentality for that age group you know what i mean whereas just getting thrown on the ground and falling it's like schoolyard play you know and they're in it's more of a game. Okay, I get to throw you, you throw me. Let's see who throws each other more times than the other. It's just a different mentality and dynamic, I think. Yeah, and I hope there will be um, what, what, what I also like in the kind of older martial arts like judo is there is a more structure in place in terms of the defined understanding of what leads to what, like what, what is the sequence of things that, 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 that is required to arrive to a particular outcome, which is your eventually your skill level or your particular uh, abilities, right? In jiu-jitsu, I think we're still lagging behind. There's no unified... It doesn't even have to be unified. There's always be different opinion, but I think there's too much time wasted on things that don't, don't eventually lead to a particularly um, positive result. It's, it's a lot of loss of productivity, let's say, in the process, because as I said, we don't really understand uh, the, the methodology behind it what i what i see lacks a lot of is, is 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 a curriculum even even in the within the associations themselves there's really no a lot of them don't have a defined curriculum that takes you from white belt to blue belt it's more time in grade sure everybody teaches certain things but i don't know if a lot of them have a definitive list of things you need to know to get your blue belt or to get your purple belt some do some don't but what I find out more often than not is that that student really doesn't know the length of time, the amount of classes and the exact skills they need to know to be blue belt. Just when I'm ready, I'll test you. When I'm ready, I'll promote you. You know, and that's, I think that's somewhat frustrating for people. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's something weirdly, so this is something that the community takes pride in. Because it's like, well, you, you don't know, just, just train hard and, and you eventually will get it. But it kind of goes counter to any other process that you're trying to get good at. What, what is your target like how, right. and, and the method how you get to this? Because what, like, if you want to achieve anything in business, you need to create a business plan. This is your target. This is what you want to get. And these are the steps that you need to take to right. achieve this target. And you can follow and there's a, the, there is a, some form of a blueprint or a, um, you know, a, a sequential um, kind of progress to achieve that. Whereas, whereas right. as I said, in Jiu-Jitsu, we kind of, as I said, weirdly taken pride in the fact that it's so unstructured. So <laughs> <laughs> it's quite curious. But as I said, through through debate and through conversations, I hope uh, we will have an opportunity to, uh, as I said, come to something more productive. And I, I have no doubt that we will. And um, I hope that, as I said, there will be more cross training, uh, more kind of utilizing of of the learning, of the learnings from other sports, which is as if so much related related. You know, judo, jiu jitsu is, is sibling sure. sports, right? So, um, that that is fantastic. So, thanks very much for your answer. That that really satisfies my my personal curiosity as instructor, uh, but I, I also really enjoyed uh, listening about your your business, and you. um, I'm really looking forward to to seeing how you develop further, how you face this crisis, and how how you succeed in the future. Um, as I said I, I learned a, th a thing or two. Uh, for sure and hopefully our listeners did as well so thanks very much awesome. Jimmy for your time my pleasure Peter thanks for having me on